forth your praises for having called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Father, help us today as we look into your word to understand that we have the blessed privilege of your forgiveness. And help us to understand your word as we examine the pages of inspiration. As we ask the question, will God run? Help us keep us from the enemy, from all of his schemes, all of his distractions, and help us to receive with meekness your engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. We ask this prayer in faith and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 15. Jesus is speaking three parables. But as we examine the text in Luke 15, it is important that we understand the settings. Settings are going to be crucial for us to really understand what's being said. The setting, first and foremost, in which Jesus is speaking these parables, and then the setting that takes place within the parables themselves. You see, in Luke 15 and verse number 1, it says, Then drew near unto him all publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You see, when you would and you and I would do good, evil is always present. Amen, somebody. We need to take note of this because it's, it's important that we understand who is around Jesus, which prompts him to speak these parables. You have the publicans and sinners which came to hear him. Amen, somebody. But then you have the scribes and Pharisees always murmuring always trying to accuse Jesus. Is that all right? Saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You see, when we examine uh, these parables, we understand that they have the very same parallel structure. All three have someone or something that has been lost. All three has someone or something that has been found. And all three, there is rejoicing over that which was lost but was found. Is that all right? You see, in the parable of the lost sheep, the sheep wandered away. Amen, somebody. In verse 7, Jesus said, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one that one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. So we see that there was joy in finding the lost sheep. And then we have the lost coin, which was carelessly misplaced or lost. And in verse 10, Jesus said, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Amen, somebody. And then we have the parable that is called the lost son. And the lost son 
didn't wander away like the sheep. The lost son wasn't carelessly misplaced or lost like the coin. The lost son voluntarily left. Amen. I'm going somewhere, y'all. See, we need to ask the question, will God run? He said, I don't understand what you're saying. You'll get it in a minute. Notice then Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11. If you have it, say amen. amen. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of my goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. See, an important thing we need to recognize off the bat is Jewish law did not require the father to honor such a request. You see, such a request wasn't to be honored until the father was dead. Amen, somebody. But in keeping with this analogy, Jesus is illustrating two things right here. Number one, he's, he's illustrating the son's attitude and heart. Because in essence, the son's request revealed and showed an inward desire for his father to be dead. He was too impatient to wait. Amen. Some of us remember when we were young and how we could not wait to be grown. We wanted to be our own boss and do what we wanted to do because we thought that we were being held back from something. We thought that we were missing out. Amen, somebody. And we felt like we were uh, being unfairly denied the right and privilege of being able to do what we wanted to do. But see, God isn't like that. The second point he's trying to teach in this right off the back is that God allows for everyone to freely choose their own ways. You see, the father could have got upset. What do you mean you, you want your portion now? You don't get that until I die. But the father here said, go ahead. He, he divided his, his, his goods, his livelihood. Go ahead and take it, son. Is that all right? God allows us to choose the ways in which we will go without forcing us. See, Deuteronomy Chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20 says it like this. Today I have given you the choice between life and death. Blessings between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. You see, God sets life and death before us. But it's our choice to make. Notice what he says. Oh, that you would choose life. In other words, God is encouraging us, choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joshua. 24, 14, and 15 says, Then Joshua told the people, Worship the Lord. Obey him and always be faithful. Just because, watch this now, just because people have a choice don't mean that we shouldn't tell them the truth. Sometimes because people have a choice, they think that we shouldn't even tell them or encourage them in the way of righteousness. But watch this. My job is to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. What you choose is up to you. Then Joshua told the people, worship the Lord, obey him, and always be faithful. Get rid of the idols 
your ancestors worshiped when they lived on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt. But if worshiping the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves today which will you worship? The gods of your fathers who, the, who worship beyond the Euphrates River and, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living? But as for me and my house, me and my family, we will worship the Lord. You see, God, God is so good. God loves us so much that he allows us to choose for ourselves. As we said in our Sunday school this morning, we don't want someone, amen, and when we're in an intimate relationship, we don't want to force someone, amen, to love us and be with us. Amen, somebody. I don't got to beg my wife. Amen, Ted. She should want to, and I should too, amen. Are we getting this? Notice then, back in Luke 15, 13, and 14, and not many days after the youngest son gathered all together, journeyed, get this now, journeyed into a far country. Are you getting that? And there wasted his possessions with riotous or prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. You see, we need to understand, he, he took a journey into a far country. We need to understand that our position and our proximity, spiritually speaking, in relation to where we are with God is everything. Let me say that again. Our position and our proximity, spiritually, in relation to where we are with God is everything. When you and I, by our own desires, by our own choices, by our own decisions, begin to distance ourselves far away from God, we become spiritually blind, numb, and we lose sense of the true reality of life. Amen, somebody? You see... It says, again in verse 13, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. This word riotous refers to living prodigal, prodigally, extravagantly wasteful because of loose living. Uh, this living is a reckless overindulgence and immoral and sensual practices. You see, newsflash, it is our own sinful choices which separate us from God. Isaiah 59, one and two says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. King James says, not too short, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call, but it is your sins that have separated you from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Notice then in verse 14, again he says, and when he had spent all, you see, sometimes we think we know a passage, but God is, continues to teach us, and we get more and more and more and more. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. 
Y'all ain't getting this. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Y'all ain't getting this. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. You see, the famine don't come until you spent everything. You see, this is what is called the intrusion of the unexpected. You see, when we were young, we all had our own perspective of how we thought life would be. How we thought life would turn out. And guess what? We believed it so much that nobody could tell us anything. Hey man, somebody. You see, famines, troubles, and disasters were the furthest thing from this son's mind when he initially took his journey. You see, we never stop to think, and I want to encourage our young folk, amen, we never stop to think that being away from home, that something can and will go wrong. Never appears to us that the way we think life is going to turn out will be that will be any different thing different from how we think it will be. Is that all right? You see, we need to understand this. Apart from God, who is our provider and protector, we not only waste all that has been given to us by God for his glory, honor, and praise. But we can never, apart from God, we can never be prepared for the unseen. You see, we need to understand that apart from God, we're blinded by our own thinking and our own perception of how life is. We're blinded to what's truly out there. Amen, somebody. If I would have known what was out there, I probably would have lived with my dad till I was 40. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? You see, when we go apart from God, this leads to destruction, but it also leads to our want being in need. You see, the enemy works to entice and draw us away with the lust and desires of this life which are within us. And that's why we're encouraged in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. He says, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you, for the world, watch this, for the world offers only, only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These, these, these are not from the Father. Stop getting stuff in a world and saying, God bless me with this. If it takes me away from God, God didn't give it to me. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. See, we takes us time to understand that our foolishness leads us into want. Hey Amen, somebody. And the psalmist says in Psalm 23, 1, we know it, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. NIV says the Lord is my shepherd I lack nothing. And LT says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. 
The CV says, you, Lord, are my shepherd. I will never be in need. You see, when I'm in proper proximity and position with God, I don't need a thing. Notice then, verses 15 and 16 says, Then he went and joined himself. Did you get this? Then he went. Because a lot of times when we go out and we squander what we got, then we try to make some 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 way we we try to do something about it is that all right then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine lord have mercy and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods or the husk that the swine eat we're talking about the husk of the corns Hey Amen. We, we love some corn on the cob, but I ain't eating no husk. Husk, you pull that stuff off. Hey Amen, somebody. He was desiring, listen, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the, with the husk that the swine ate. How bad does life have to be for you to look at some husk? When husk looks appetizing, then life is not so good at that point. And no one gave him anything. You see, watch this. This acceptance by the son of such a despised and low position clearly demonstrates the degree and extent of his want. Are y'all getting that? This very same son, notice, this very same son who, who thought and found it being under the ruling government of his father to be so undesirable, so unbearable, now, He's in this lowly condition. And it's detestable because you have to understand the picture that Jesus is painting. This man is going out tending to some swine. It was forbidden for the Jews to eat swine. Therefore, it was unlawful for the Jews to keep swine. So this shows the deepest conceivable degradation that it was to even engage in such an employment, especially under this foreign citizen who was not even willing to give him a portion that was even better than the swine. Are y'all getting in? No one gave him anything. Where are the so-called friends? You see, it takes us years to understand that no one will really be there for you. It takes us years. No one gave him anything. He desired a portion that they were eating, but no one gave him anything. Where's all the people that helped him to waste what he had. You see, when you got some stuff, you got a lot of company. A lot of people want to be around you. And that's why we always say you have to ask yourself, what do people value you for? Don't lie to yourself. Be honest and ask, what do people value you for? Amen, somebody. You see, the object of this image is used by the Lord to illustrate the deep degradation, the deep pollution, and wretchedness, and hopelessness, loneliness, and brokenness that sin will lead us into. You see, this is why it says, verse 17,
but when he came to himself. When he came to himself. Another translation says when he came to his senses. Is that all right? Uh, this, this phrase, metaphorically, it means and speaks to one who has come to their senses and has returned to a healthy state of mind. You see, this is a very expressive phrase which is only applied uh, to an individual who has been deranged of mind. Therefore, when people are deranged and they recover, we say what? They've come to themselves. Is that all right? Here, Jesus specifically points out to the fact that the foolishness of the son was a type of derangement. And that he behaved as one who was mad or insane. And so it is the case with all sinners. Watch this. When sin is on the throne of our lives, we are estranged from God and led by the influence of evil desires and passions which are contrary to our better judgment and decisions of a sound mind. Some of us, even as children of God, have got caught up in some mess and we couldn't believe ourselves once God recovered us out of the snare of the enemy. We couldn't believe ourselves what we got ourselves into. How did I fall for that again? Yeah. Amen, somebody, again. Don't sit there and act like you're too good to get caught up. That's the first symptom of getting caught up. You don't think you can get caught up. And when you don't think you can get caught up, you do nothing to prepare to protect yourself. Listen. He says, when he came to himself, he says, I will arise and go to my father. Amen. He's talking to himself. Amen, somebody. Sometimes you get caught up from bad. You just got to speak to yourself. Mark, you dummy. What, what you doing, man? What, what's going on? Amen, somebody. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against heaven. You see, he's come to himself because he's realized he offended his father, but first and foremost, he offended God. We don't understand that when we offend each other, first and foremost, we offend God. We don't understand that. So that, that, that's why we justify our behaviors. Well, they did something too. Well, if they did something too, then both of you have offended God. Are we getting this? Watch this. This shows, he says, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I am, watch this, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, make me like one of your hired servants. You see, this, this demonstrates the son's poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit is necessary and essential to true repentance. You see, some of us repent, but we're just sorry we got caught. Oh, we sorry that somebody found out how I treated you. Hey, man, somebody. So I repent because I have to. Well, if I've sinned against anybody, I know I, I, I just cussed for it out yesterday. I don't need to come before y'all and say if I've sinned against anybody, I need to go to Floyd and get it right with Floyd. He says, I will arise. Now notice. This doesn't imply that he was sitting down. 
Don't take this literally. In Hebrew, this phrase, I will arise, meant leaving immediately from one place in order to enter into another. You need to get this. This is important. It speaks to the fact, when he says, I will arise, it speaks to the fact that the son had made up his mind. He was determined. He had purpose in his heart. I'm getting out of this situation and I'm going back because I'm wrong. Amen, somebody. True repentance requires godly sorrow. Is that all right? You see, as long as he was away from his father and contrary to his father, we need to get this spiritually, he was not truly himself. He was only himself, truly, when he was on his way back home. And you and I will not be ourselves, truly, till we are on our way back home. You see, let me say this. Successful actions are only a result of a made up and determined mind. Let me, let me go a little further. Let me illustrate this for you. We always say that the victory was on the cross. I beg to differ, now that I have some understanding. Yeah, the victory was on the cross. But understand, before Jesus could say, it is finished, he had to first be resolved to say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So it was in that very moment that he made up and determined his mind, the battle was already won. Are we getting this? Some of us are living to the standard that God has called us to, we're not successful in areas of our lives because we have yet to make up our mind. Some things, if we're honest about it, there's some things in our lives that we're going back and forth. And it's a fight. I'm not trying to be insensitive. It's a fight. But God is trying to show us that stuff ain't good for you. You got to make up. I'm, I want to help you, but you got to make up your mind. Notice then, verse 18 and 19, he says, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, and say to him, your repentance ain't good if you don't acknowledge and confess what you've done. Some of us deceive ourselves into thinking that we are all right with God. We ain't confess nothing. We ain't confess to God. We ain't been to the person. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Again, make me, make me like one of your hired servants. Are we getting this? See, while we're in sin, we have nowhere else to go but to God. You say, why do you say that? Because when we're in sin, there's no one else who can deliver us. And unless we're willing to go to the only one who can deliver us, amen, somebody, the one that we have truly offended, we will never be saved. 
Amen. Psalm 32, 3 through 5 says, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Sin is a cancer. Not confessing it is a cancer. It will eat you away. And if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you better be careful, because if you allow it to fester too long, you'll become numb to where it don't bother you at all. And actually, you'll convince yourself that, oh, I ain't wrong. Is that all right? Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. You see, God will trouble us sometimes. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, finally, I confess all my sin to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Don't it feel good when you confess to God? People will be people. But as long as I'm all right with God, I can breathe. See, poor in spirit, we talked about poverty of spirit, poverty of spirit or poor in spirit. You remember Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit speaks to the individual who because of coming to recognize their own condition of being completely lacking, helpless, and destitute and poor spiritually becomes conscious of their essential need for God. Poor in spirit means I come to recognize that spiritually I'm helpless. I need God. There's nothing I can do. And watch this. There's nothing you can do for me. Notice then, as I hasten, and he arose and came to his father. He arose and came to his father. Let me just drop this. Another critical and essential aspect of our repentance is that we have to have the faith, trust, and confidence in God that he will kindly accept us. Y'all ain't getting that. In order for me to repent and come back, I first have to believe that he'll accept me. He'll be kind to me. Amen, somebody. God is not like people, and sometimes we put him in that category. Amen. You know when you've done something wrong with somebody, and you, you, you're trying to decipher whether or not you should go and ask their forgiveness because, you know, they may say no, they, they may get even madder. So that kind of sometimes play into the fact of whether we do it or not. But with God, we have to have faith that he will be faithful to his promises. Is that all right? Are we getting this? Because again, watch this. He had said, I'm no longer to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You see, we have to have the humility to even come back to God. Without humility, you can forget about it. Humility keeps us from the prideful and arrogant thinking that we are entitled to be, in, to be reinstated. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Y'all looking at me like. Humility keeps us from the prideful thinking that we are entitled to be reinstated. Sometimes people will offend you, come say they sorry, but tell you how you're going to feel about it. Well, you said you forgive me. We don't reserve the right. We're undeserving. 
Are we getting this? We don't, we, we can't tell God, God, you're supposed to. Y'all need to get this. We need to get this. Humility protects us from that frame of thinking. This son was humble to a point where he said, I ain't even asking to be your son anymore. Just let me be a servant. Can you do that? Is that all right? You see, as we close, the great and terrible misconception of this parable is that it's about the son. It is not about the son. Listen, it's not about the son and his journey away from his father. It's not about his foolishness and coming to himself and then returning home. And he returned home, by the way, to an angry brother. And we'll deal with that this afternoon. But it's not about that. Verse 20 says, and he arose and came to his father. But he was still a great way off. You need to get this. He was still a great way off. Even when we make up our minds to go home, we're still a great way off. His father saw him. He saw him. He saw him. He saw him. He saw him. You see, of these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, this is the only one in which the someone or something which was lost was not sought after. The lost sheep was sought after. The lost coin was swept and sought after. But the lost son, when you really examine it, was not sought after. He was still a great distance away. And his father saw him. And you and I may ask, why was he never sought after? Because his father never ceased to look after him. He never stopped looking for him. He was always watching and waiting. Father saw him coming home because he never stopped looking out. And the father sees us coming home because he never stops looking out for us. Even when we've left God in order to go into a far country, we are never truly out of his sight. He never seeks, cease, ceases to look out for us. He's always watching waiting for us while working providentially to provide a way for us to come to ourselves and to come back home. But he was still a great way off and his father saw him, had compassion and ran, fell on his neck kissed him. 
Notice, Jesus illustrates this parable in order to show without a shadow of a doubt that none of us are truly deserving of salvation. None of us are truly deserving of salvation by any merit of our own. We can say we think it's about the son because he came to himself and went back home. He's still not deserving. Even when you and I come to ourselves and come back home, even when we make up our minds to obey the gospel, we're still not deserving. So the question was, will God run? Yes. Yes. He will run to save them who come to him. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. And this near is an extreme closeness. See, we can't come real close to God. But God is always close to us. Psalm 145 and verse 18 says it like this. The Lord is near or close to all of them that call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You see, I close with this. This should never be referred to as the parable of the lost son. Because it's not about the son, it's all about the love of the father. And we need to understand that it's not just simply because we repent or that we walk all the way back home, but it's for one reason, and one reason alone, and I want you to get this. The father ran to him not because of anything he did. He ran to him because he was his son. He was his son. It's all about the Father and his great love for us. It's not about us. That's why we read in our meditation, because of his great love for us. It's only by grace that we're saved. It's great love for us. Oh, what's that? Such a love he has for us. He ran because that was his son. Y'all ain't getting this. He ran because that was his son. He ran because that was his son. The word of God says to us in 1 John chapter 3, Verse number one, behold what manner of love. Behold how much the Father has loved us that we should be called the children of God. God runs to us because we are his children. You're not a child of God today. You need to be one. Amen, somebody. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For you are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Notice, verse 26, 7 says, For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's not just 
belief and faith alone, we have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say, how do we do that? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have to hear, we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of our sins. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and verse 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead on the third day. You see, a lot of people are saying in the religious world, just confess with your, with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's all you have to do to be saved. No, notice the text. We confess unto salvation. We're on our way. We're not there yet. We have to be baptized. Notice when we read, when we quoted Galatians 3.27, for as many as you as have been baptized, notice, into, into. Confession is unto, belief is unto, baptism puts us into Christ. Jesus said himself, Mark 16, 15 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we extend that great invitation to you right now. God is waiting. He's always been watching. He's waiting. But you and I have to make our own mind up. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, but maybe we've traveled into a far country, and I pray you come back this afternoon because you and I need to understand you don't have to go physically into a far country to be lost. There's some sitting right in the house who's lost in the sauce. Consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.